target text etc yeah thank you sir so uh, in in this paper we have around five units Yes, so we have been going through what translation is and uh, how, uh, what, what translation, uh, the various uh, theories that translation has introduced and what is, what has been its development right from the ancient days. These are, uh, these are some of the topics that have been covered in uh, the first four units and uh, we also, you know, the two important uh, key terms which you will have to compulsorily remember is the source language and the target language. Okay, why I repeatedly keep telling you this is because you have to compulsorily remember these two terms because these are the two terms which are uh, key things in this. And of course, you have the translator, translation, etc. etc. Okay, so now. Um, uh, just to sum up, you know, we have been looking at uh, translation and translator giving importance to the interpretation. Translation and interpretation are one and the same only. Uh, interpretation is regarded as a subcategory of translation. So um, both requires uh, skill and both requires training. And uh, today... And we also saw, you know, some of the important terms that were given at the end of each unit. And uh, the, these, these uh, short notes and the essays form the kind of, um, you know, sample questions, etc., which will give you an idea of how to go about with the examination part. Now, coming to uh, Unit 5, Translation Studies Today. So, after reading this uh, unit we will be having an idea about um, how translation has achieved a massive development through the ages. So we saw this translation was there right from the period of Cicero, uh, the Romans. Okay. So, uh, and we saw how uh, the different ages, down the ages during the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, etc. How down the ages people have been uh, involved in translation and uh, mainly we understood that people were giving importance to getting the meaning out of the text. So um, unit two was entirely concentrating on the linguistics part of the language where um, the various terms also we became familiar with like you had the semantic field, you, have some, you had something called the semimes uh, you 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 understood what role a syntax was playing in translation, etc., etc. Now, after looking into all these things, we have now come to the different schools of translation. Actually, in this chapter, we will be looking at the uh, say uh, important schools of translations in the last fifty years, and also the salient features of these schools and how the school how each school re redefines the act of translation or, and how each school uh, defines the purpose of translation. So, uh, right from the beginning, I have been telling that meaning was the most important thing in translation. Uh, the, the role of the translator was to pick out the meaning from the original text, from the source text, and then uh, put it in 
the target text without changing the message without changing the thing and uh, the job of the translator was to uh, was to take take the message was to make equivalent uh, was to convert each form or each text into its equivalent uh, form and uh, you know we had different kinds of translations word for word translation sense for sense translations etc so as days moved and uh, we, saw, we see the massive development in translation where you know you have some kind of change in this uh, looking at translation okay instead of word for word concepts were given importance and uh, it this translation uh, originally uh, it was subservient to the uh, original work it was subservient to the um, source text target text was translator was not given uh, equal importance as that was given to the original writer of the uh, work um, this kind of superior uh, image was given to the original writer and inferior image not inferior but the translator was considered as being secondary but as days have gone in the current period in the contemporary era we see that translation has attained enormous height um we see that especially you know with the dev- uh, with the coming up of uh, deconstruction theories post structuralist theories of which you should be aware of and uh, the modern era we see that uh, translation has acquired new dimensions so it is mainly you know used to shake off the eurocentric inheritance especially with the uh, studies in post colonial uh, uh, post colonial theories after the emergence of post colonial theories and all we have a totally different view with regard to translation so um, this kind of word for word translation sense for sense translation and all you know um, trying to find out uh, perfect equivalent for the words expressed in the source text all that you know they are, although they were primary importance is now given to culture also so the main change that we can see is um, apart from considering translation as an attempt at uh, linguistic analysis uh, bringing out the interpretation anal- analysis and interpretation now it has taken a big role of bringing culture into it that is the main thing this entire chapter chapter 5 will concentrate on how culture is given huge importance by the translators okay so uh, the, the responsibility lies with the translator translator has to shoulder the responsibility of holding up the cultures earlier it was said that the translator have to be fluent in both the languages tamil i mean the source text language and the target text language now the responsibility of the translator is in uh, being well versed in having a high command over the knowledge of culture of both the languages okay so now coming to this uh, uh, thing on page 152 translations development outside europe so now we are going to see how translation has been in other countries also so brazil brazil translators have especially with the development of post colonial discourse okay post colonial india was a colonial country so what 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 it means to look at after colonialism tendencies okay so the post colonial discourse so here we have one important school we are going to look at the different schools of translation so to start with we are going to look at a school of translation that were, that got developed in brazil so brazilian cannibalism okay so can this concept this brazilian cannibalism comes from the word cannibal cannibalism so these brazilian translators have introduced a new concept new met, uh, have introduced a new metaphor so they have placed the image of the translator as a cannibal so who is a cannibal a cannibal is a human being uh, a cannibal is a person who eats other human beings okay so here the image of the translator is a cannibal so the idea behind this is to shock the european colonizers to uh, you know shock them 
by adapting this idea of cannibalism see the britishers and the europeans the americans called these native people as cannibals so they say okay we are cannibals only but uh, cannibals in, in in what way in uh, eating away the source text and then creating something completely new see the total concept of translation now is you can translate the european text you can translate an english text to your native language but when you are translating you uh, keep in mind you take enough care to rep- uh, to represent your culture in a positive way okay so you do you you do not you don't simply glorify the culture of the europeans you simply don't go glorify the culture of the english people rather and um, you bring about a positive image about your own culture also so these um, see earlier stance was keeping the original text in a high pedestal keeping the source text in a high pedestal but now it is not like that uh, the, um, the the target text the tt is also equally important from the po- from which point of view means from the cultural point of view okay so the person who is translating the translator is a creator in his own right he himself is a creator like that of the author of the source text it is a creation in its own right so the translated text is in the native tongue and uh, native ideology is also brought in here um, so this kind this concept is actually attempting at refashioning and appropriating european culture art and ideas into one's own native language so reassertion of native culture do not just like that translate the text into uh, the target language do not just like that translate the source text into target language instead you assert your native culture so the big responsibility that is there on the part of the translator is to uh, is to assert the native culture okay so one simple example so they say earlier they said you have to um, um, be very faithful to the work that you are translating but now they say you need not be fa- you need not make faithful translation of the source text you need not maintain fidelity towards the source text but you assert yourself against european post colonial cultural domination don't allow the european countries be it america or britain or whatever it is western countries don't allow them to uh, enter your country uh, showing their culture as being superior your culture is also superior so when a person who is translating from your own country the translator he has the responsibility of um, giving a dominating perspective of his own culture also so for example this uh, shakespeare's famous soliloquy to be or not to be that is a question so this shakespeare's soliloquy is translated is translated into brazil i mean the line that uh, he, uh, the translator converts this to be or not to be as to be or not to be that is the question so because this to be is a tribe so in order to celebrate that tribe they have translated like this so this uh, cannibalistic translation was uh, principally coined by the brazilian translator haroldo de campos he is a brazilian poet and a translator so very beautifully they have brought out this concept so this is the brazilian cannibalistic uh, school of translation okay the next one is the next point that they uh, try to emphasize upon is they are using jack derrida's post structuralist concept jack derrida's concept uh, where J- derrida claims the translation process itself as writing a original text he says translated text itself is a original text only he calls translator as a creator okay so his uh, he applies the post structuralist uh, theories into this translation fields and uh, we have come to a period where 
translation has moved away from uh, purely being linguistics. Okay. Now, coming to the African contribution, what was uh, Africans' uh, contribution for translation? You have the famous Nigerian writer Ole Soyinka, who's a receiver of Nobel Prize in Literature in 1986. So here, uh, he says, like, he... Uh, Mm, uh, says uh, he's strongly against the kind of racism that is present in the translated works. He recognizes the implicit racism that is there and he says when a, when a translator has translated uh, the English uh, source text, the Westerner source text into target language, into one's own native language, there we see how the translator has glorified the Western culture and make the post-colonial or uh, make the colonized countries people as savages, cannibals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the native people's culture is given in a negative term. So when a child or a reader reads this reads from this perspective, uh, considering the Western culture as being superior, and um, See, uh, he quotes the uh, he quotes an example. He says he reads a story where white people are attacked by savages. Who are the savages? Savages are the native people. So when the native people read this, it's like uh, demeaning. Uh, it's like demeaning themselves. Okay, so uh, it was a shock to him when he read this, and hence he came up with some. Theory. He came up with some concepts uh, wherein he strongly resisted portraying the Western culture as a glorified one. And he said he's not going to be a partner in glorifying the Western culture. Uh, instead, he would give a positive picture of the uh, colonized people. So here, Ole Soinka said that the translator acts as an intermediary. Uh, intermediary. He's a powerful intermediary. Now coming to translation and post-colonial studies. So um, translation acted as a powerful tool to go against imperialism and colonialism. And uh, now during the period where English has become an official language as a global language, uh, it lies in the hands of the translator uh, to propagate a positive image about the a culture of the colonized countries. So um, the power of representation and transmission of ideology. Translation as a means for the construction of cultural rep representations. So now, apart from the responsibility of uh, translating a text, either in a literal way of free translation or conceptual translation, the added responsibility lies with the uh, translator in hold, uh, in holding up the culture of the um, native people also. The, the target here is the readers. So the reader's language, the reader's culture. So that also should be uh, portrayed in a positive way. So these, it means like the translated text is, the source text is completely recreated here. Um, the source text is completely recreated here so uh, no longer the same old uh, terms and expressions which were expressed in the source text is going to be blindly translated into the target text so this kind um, now uh, with the globalization and uh, with the hybrid uh, tendencies of cultures hybridity cultural diversity etc uh, there is a need to go beyond the linguistics. The translators need to go beyond the linguistic uh, uh, li linguistic nature and has to be gain expertise over the culture of both the language languages also. So now they bring in uh, famous personalities, post-colonial writers like Guy Tri Spivak from USA and Liliana Valenzuela, etc., to just give us instances of how it should be actually. So uh, earlier, the notions were like 
the author of the original text was superior and the translator was invisible actually but now they say that the translator has to be visible here for instance gayatri spivak has translated the indian writer mahasweta devi's prose so gayatri spivak saw to it that she has maintained the tone of the original author in her prose so um, gayatri spivak also uh, gave a for afterward the translator's afterward was there the translator's preface was there in the um, translation and a collection of notes end of book glossary was given documentation was there terms and references so everything concentrated on political cultural and literary aspects also so that is what gayatri spivak had done and there was another writer liliana valenzuela who had translated from the minor literatures of native american writers into english especially the novel caramelo by the chicana writer sandra sisner sisner ross adds a substantial note at the end of the project so the translators who had come up later on um, um, uh, saw to it that they provided their own preface they uh, they often uh, they voiced down their thoughts about the translation what it meant translating that text and why they were translating the purpose of translation and uh, they also you know voiced out they shared the they, they shared how difficult that text was the uh, translating that text was they they told us what uh, amount of labor went into translating that so here this writer actually shared to her readers how a lot of people had helped her in finding appropriate words and expressions which were not found in dictionaries and um, uh, how much of uh, effort went into it translating that what labor went into it and uh, um, uh, and she also uh, not only that particular writer but all the other translators too how they face the challenge of portraying culture so they should take care in not getting prejudiced they should do they should translate the text in a very ethical manner in a very prejudice free manner so since uh, nowadays because of globalization uh, in, in internet and other things we see how culture has become very intercultural so this intercultural challenge is very much there it is not it cannot be avoided in our society it is a part of our society and uh, when a person translates he or she has to take full account of linguistic hybridity and cultural diversity so culture plays a very very important role and the translator is the person who has the power to construct the image of a literature and a culture so he has the power to shape so literature he is a shaping force in uh, bringing out uh, bringing out the culture of a place and uh, portraying it in either negative way or positive way the cultural dy dynamics that Uh, the cultural dynamics in the socio cultural context that the writer has to concentrate on so the power that uh, translation has the power that translators have is now uh, being emphasized upon so um, uh, there comes in the ethics when a person is in charge of rewriting the culture of a nation rewriting okay reportrayal rerepresentation so we have to avoid misrepresentation also so while re representing cultures of two different languages two different places then what amount of seriousness should the translator possess that has to be taken into care and um, this thing also talks about the interface between translation and post colonialism so the question of power the question of power okay so it has crossed beyond the uh, concentration of language alone it is not language alone it has crossed the linguistic boundaries it has reached the cultural uh, arena now culture because language is an integral part of culture you cannot separate 
language and culture you cannot see language and culture as two different things they are one and the same so traditional approach to linguistics um is a, a traditional approach to linguistics is no is not given any more importance so extra linguistic reality has come in here and uh, this extra linguistic reality gives importance to the context the culture the situation etc so when we say culture it is being it is being more personal and uh, function also it is being more for, for personal where, where where individuals think and function as such and it is all it is not only personal it is also collective because we see translation from a social context and then it is also expressive where the society expresses itself so language is the only social institution without which no other social institution can function so um, it is very very important that language and culture are seen from the point of view as being interrelated okay interrelated and uh, nowadays we see translation as a process of literary manipulation you have to manipulate you have to plan because the westerners have so far been propagating that their culture was superior how did they managed to do this because they had colonized many countries they had many countries under their domination they had oppressed many countries so wherever they went they propagated their culture their language as being superior so now the um, uh, it is time for the post colonial countries to wake up from that and why it the responsibility lies with the translator that translator has to make literary manipulation because it is almost like it is not simply translating from the source text to the target text instead it is rewriting it is going beyond the literary linguistic boundaries you have to take into consideration the cultural context the context of history historical context and cultural context has to be taken into consideration so it is this translation is not simply a word for word translation literal translation no nothing like that instead it should be a transmission of text across cultures and literatures across cultures and literatures so that is why andre lefvier has coined the term refraction where he says this involves change of perception what is this change of perception what happens when a text crosses boundaries what happens when a text crosses from one culture to another how does the source text people how does a source text uh, author portray this his culture and when it is brought down to the target text who are the readers who are going to read it so rewriting has to take place and translation is now seen as a complete task which needs a great deal of skill preparation knowledge intuitive feeling so like writing a book translation is also an art it is also an art no more translation is like what you should do and what you should not do instead translation has now entered an arena where it is evaluative terminology okay uh, evaluative terminology and the complexity of the translation arises because of the perception that the translator has about cultural history so there are a lot of problems that the translator faces because of these new developments in translation because of the interface between translation and culture a translator has to do extensive work see this uh, writer peter torop in the book uh, total translation talks about synecdoche uh, synecdoche means using a part for a whole so here he says language also can be considered as 
culture because both cannot exist without the existence of another language and culture has to exist together so here he talks about language as culture language as meta language to describe cultural language you need language so language is a tool to express culture so it is a meta language then it is also a language of signs s i g n s signs okay semiotic so system so all these things also should be taken into consideration and uh, the translator uh, being culturally uh, uh, being culturally conscious conscious about the cultural backgrounds of both the languages while he is using his words or expressions he has to use addition componential analysis cultural equivalent descriptive equivalent literal translation recognized translation reduction synonymy transference deletion etc etc which we were looking at in the last class so if translation sim, um, uh, to describe translation in simpler terms we would simply say that whatever is given in the source text is decoded and then it is re encoded in the target language isn't it so but now the translator apart from simply decoding from the source text and re encoding it in the target text should also take into consideration the multiculturalism of the present day multiculturalism of the present day has to be taken into consideration because nations have started merging uh nations and their cultures have started merging culturally okay it has become an international paradigm where boundaries are disappearing and the differences between peoples are getting lost so every culture has their own idiosyncrasies and every culture is culture bound so it is time for the translator to accept the fact that translation is very challenging well he should be well versed with the cultural words proverbs idiomatic expressions of each culture so um, uh, a writer called melanovsky was uh, uh, um, interested in coining the term context of situation so when a translator indulges in translation he should take into account the environment to which he is going to present the text he should take into account the totality of the culture surrounding the act of text production and reception so uh th this kind of uh, culture when uh, it is getting interpreted when it is getting analyzed then it becomes a shared system for interpreting the reality and organizing experience so this word shared uh attains a uh, huge uh, significance because the non shared elements of language and culture that create the need for transfer transfer and translation so coming to the next uh, tier topic the systems theory approach so we have something called as systems theory approach here also we see that culture plays a very very important part important role the systems theory approach where the school the school of translation emphasizes on the target goal this emphasizes on the target goal so they say you uh, uh, the translator the translator should not only take care with the linguistics aspects historical aspects socio political aspects but also to the problems outside the text that is translated okay he should, he should also concentrate on paratextual problems to the problems outside the text that is translated so how do you explain this for instance um uh, translating shakespeare into languages indian languages is different from translating shakespeare into japanese because japan was not a was not colonized by the british whereas india was so um, you know the the difference the significance 
of translation of Shakespeare into these two different countries should be looked at because uh, the the what, what what to say the post colonial uh, aspects which come into this the oppression suppression aspects so while translating uh, we'll have to look into the problems that exist outside the text also how it will affect the native people because british has colonized india so when a british text is translated into indian language um, what will be the kind of reception to the readers how will the readers accept it because definitely shakespeare is going to um, glorify his culture and uh, there will be instances where the native culture will be uh, written in an uh, oppressive manner or uh, written in a negative manner so this kind of uh, uh, things have to be concentrated upon they say then coming to ideology and translation here this again is a post structuralist uh, uh, this again concentrates on post structuralism and functionalism this questions the author superiority over the translator original writer superiority over the translator so here again we see that the translator has to um, keep in mind the culture of the language into which he is going to translate and the social values of that culture so everything has to be keep kept in mind so the ideology of translation will be a combination of all these five things the content of the source text and then the speech act of the source text that is represented in the source text the style or the representation and then its relevance to the receptor audience and the various speech acts so the ideology of translation lies not simply in the text translated but the voicing and stance of the translator so what voice how he is going to portray it to the uh, receivers that is more important they say and then the sixth topic is hermeneutics and translation theory this particular word hermeneutics hermeneutics refers to interpretation hermeneutics refers to interpretation so uh, especially it was based on the german philosopher uh, hans george gadamer's work so here um they uh, this in uh, this hermeneutics uh, emphasize that uh, this does not depend only on the scope of linguistics but uh, three impo four important things are necessary for making this kind of uh, translation uh, one is language apart from meaning i mean okay so meaning is very very important apart from uh, trying to get the meaning language the text author and the reader well, without these four aspects then it might not be very effective so whoever is translating should be completely prejudice free and uh, so you have uh, some other authors views also portrayed here so one school of translation says or one school advises the translators to keep up the cultural milieu in mind the writer's purpose in writing as well as the cultural milieu and then the narrator who's going to narrate things in the text and the first people to whom the translator is writing and the last important thing is the setting of the writing so here retranslation of earlier translations are also being done nowadays it seems because the earlier translations might not have focused strongly on culture on uh, uh, giving a view to the readers but uh, retranslations would have been done keeping all these in mind how the culture of the native people is portrayed so this retranslation will emphasize on interpretations on the originality and creativity see uh, nowadays the translator's creativity is also emphasized upon 
the translator like the original writer of the source text also should be very uh, creative that is what is said okay so especially with post structuralism and uh, post structuralism with the uh, with derrida's theories and with um, roland barth's theories you have this reader response criticism i don't know if you have heard about the reader response criticism in deconstruction derrida says that the author is dead okay the author is dead text also is dead derrida says author is dead text also is dead who makes the text comes alive come alive who makes the text come alive it is the readers who make the text al come alive see a textbook if it is not read by the readers then no meanings will come that the um, ancient perception or the original perception was the author of a book puts in all the meaning into a textbook and he writes something and it is because of the author that the meanings emerge but the new uh, post structuralist views are the birth of the reader is only when he takes a book and reads it so here Uh, the author is not supreme it is only the readers who are supreme superior so the translator is also like that only so a translator interprets text by setting them against a backdrop of known words phrases existing statements conventions etc so you should remember this so uh, the post structuralist thinkers say that the original and the translation are equally important the translation has equal weightage as that of the original text so um, the translator is as superior as that of the original author the source text author then you have functionalism and translation here uh, again same things are repeated dethroning the author okay pulling down the author from the throne he was occupying and emphasizing the role of the translator as an independent reader of the source text so the role of the translator as a creator of the target text and giving priority to purpose of producing target text so it is here that the scopus theory comes into existence a scopo scopos scopos the word scopos comes from the greek word which means purpose or scope hope you all understand till this now the scopos theory emphasizes so what is the scopos theory scope okay so this scopos theory emphasizes the role of the translator as an expert in translation action so the role of the translator as an expert in the translational action and the source text no longer is a sacred original okay source text is no longer considered as very holy very sacred but it is only an object that offers information okay which will be decided by the translator which will be decided by the translator as to what to take what to delete what to um you know what, what he has to present to the readers of the target text so scopus theory emphasizes on the role of the translator as an expert who will be having uh, enough knowledge of both the cultures and he will be the superior authority in uh, deciding what he has to give to the readers of the target text okay so what he has to re encode what he has to decode from the source text and what he has to re encode in the target text so this will be the uh, so Im immense responsibility is placed on the writer of the target text keeping in mind the readers of the target text so um, uh, role of the translator is emphasized upon and he will be the expert in translational action who considers the source text no longer as the sacred original that is what scopus theory is trying to emphasize upon and then you have on page 178 the schematic view of functionalist and non functionalist approaches okay 
where there are two columns three columns actually uh, stating who how a translator should be a translator is loyal to his client functionalist says that translator should be loyal to the readers to his clients people who are reading his book whereas a non functionalist view is uh, translator should be faithful to the original text should be faithful to the author functionalist says that the author's role should be very visible author is the final i mean uh, the translator is the final authority translator should be visible whereas the non functionalist says uh, that he should not be visible and then uh, translation processes should be target text oriented this is told by the functionalist whereas the non functionalist say that they should be source text oriented and uh, non functionalists say that linguistic equivalence is important the word for word translation literal translation should produce the source text in a very faithful manner so that they say whereas the functionalists say that communicate it should be communicative that message is more important context is more important concept is more important and they emphasize on the acceptability of it and the uh, translation tools uh, must be taken from psycho social linguistics text linguistics whereas non functionalists say that it should be more contrast from contrastive linguistics and lexical semantics meaning is more important they say so that is what uh, the two pages no the notes on pages 179 and uh, describes to you in detail now coming to translation and notions of gender so gender so what is uh, what is this gender in linguistic category we, we say call this he and she the pronouns the two pronouns he and she uh, mark the gender in linguistic category whereas in social category it uh, attains social significance okay where how men and women ought to behave in society so um, this is what we are going to look at here uh, for example in some uh, languages in some languages um uh, sin is portrayed as a woman for example in the russian language sin is portrayed as a woman whereas in uh, german language sin is portrayed as masculine so when a translator translates he now comes across the problem of translation when it comes to grammatical gender so in order not to misrepresent he has to be thorough with the ideology of that society the concept of social gender he has to be well versed in it only then he can bring about gender accuracy uh, in some languages you see the sun as feminine and the moon as masculine in some other languages it might be the reverse so the translator must know the culture of both the languages and try to put forth them accordingly okay so um, uh, it is said that social gender assignment is dependent on pragmatic and societal considerations now uh, they have listed out the various uh, translation problems occurring to due to social gender you can just give a reading and you will understand that now coming to translation and women's writing so here again the politics of language and cultural differences that the translator has to be aware of the politics of language and the cultural differences as well as the ethics of translation so revising traditional sexist metaphors and reinterpreting translating uh, translation myths so this uh, women's writing is almost equal to post post colonial writings so um, uh, what injustice was given to post colonial um, uh, aspects the post colonial literatures third world women literature so that will uh, the problems of race culture class gender sexuality etc so that will have its impact again here the translator should uh, should uh, should possess ethics and uh, should see to it that uh, he does not make any misrepresentations 
so when it comes to the when it comes to women's writing no uh, this translation is again used as a powerful tool especially uh, this feminist translation which undertakes a rewriting of uh, literatures so that is a very powerful tool so um, in order to bring about a change in the lives of women so that is what is uh, spoken of in translation and women's writing then they have something called as a poly system approach to translation so what is this poly poly system approach to translation so here uh, literature is seen as a system operating as a part of a larger social cultural historical systems of the target culture so you have the source text representing the source culture source language source be language people's culture so here we see that this system um has uh, is seen as a part of the larger social cultural and historical system so here they say we give importance to all literary works see you have different uh, genres you have different writings like thrillers children's literature translator literature etc etc so um, and uh, during the different times what is the kind of position that it is going to hold these texts these literary texts what position they are going to hold so you have the central position marginal position weak strong secure insecure etc okay the binary opposites so uh, how the translator has to take care in presenting uh, whether a liter whether uh, one culture people should be kept in the margins and another kept in the center one in the periphery another in the center one as one portrayed as strong another as weak so all these has to be taken into consideration they say so um uh, all together it is said that translate uh, translation studies or translated literature should be very innovative it should be very innovative it should not occupy a secondary position instead it should be in the primary position it should not uh, uh, be thrown to a secondary place it should not be given inferior position because just like the original text just like the source text this target text also target language also uh, plays a very important role where the readers have to be concentrated upon to whom the translator is translating for so this has to be uh, kept on my kept in mind then you have something called as descriptive translation studies so descriptive translation studies what is this a writer called twerry uh, situates the text within target culture system so he has uh, proposed the following three phase methodology for descriptive translation studies one is situating the text within the target culture system okay uh, to which audience you are writing for that audience for that target language you have to place the text that is the first point and the second point is situate the text within the target culture system and then comparing the uh, source text and the target text for ships shifts okay uh, where uh, actually you could generalize and where you can go away from the source text and then drawing implications for decision making in future translating so here uh, tuary gideon tuary actually calls a translator not a simple person he he does not call the translator simply as a person but the translator is a socially and historically constituted subject he is a socially and historically constituted subject so these translators interpret text by setting the backdrop 
keeping in mind the target text audience so um, keeping in mind the culture of the target text audience so he will use words phrases statements etc etc in such a way that it suits the ideology the culture of the target text people so that is what is uh, given in descriptive translation studies so he goes about with uh, certain other things also and lastly some important concepts in translation studies are given uh, wherein you know they make a review of what this translation is how the theory has emerged uh, so it is said that translation is not supposed to take a secondary position a translator also is not supposed to take a trans uh, secondary position whereas they have unique identity a translator has a unique identity um they, they are not mere copies of the original whereas they have their unique identities and they have their own uh, merits and uh, translation plays a very very important role in uh, portraying the culture of a society and uh, especially you know it is used as tools for post colonial studies etc it is used as a tool for de-westernization you know what all the westerners have done glorifying their culture glorifying their color and uh, calling everything connected to western as being superior and everything connected to the third world countries as being inferior so the responsibility lies with the translator to demythicize all these things so they have mythicized they have called themselves as superior so these factors these things have to be demythicized for which translation is very much useful and the translation has now emerged as a very powerful study and uh, hence it is very very important that it has been uh inserted in the academy and it has been brought out as a study uh, it has been brought out as a uh, paper you know for us to study so we have seen the right from looking translation the different concepts as a simple thing uh, starting from uh, regarding translation as something that um, converts the source text into a target text by either by free translation or simply tran you know translating word for word sense for sense we have now seen to what extent it has developed so numerous theories have come up to propagate the importance of translation so for you from exam point of view everything is given quite clearly wherein uh the the questions taken for discussion at the back of the units are very very important and that will give you a clear idea of how to prepare for your exams also so that's it for today thank you
Hello, good evening. So here I'm, um, we'll continue with yesterday's class uh, for uh, English language teaching. So yesterday I uh, kind of concluded with, um, I concluded with teaching vocabulary and teaching literature. So today we will um, begin with um, an introduction into what is teaching literature. So as uh, teachers and learners of uh, literature, uh, language first and uh, now in a very broader way literature what is literature so literature uh, has often uh, been defined in various ways but if we uh, would like to try what literature is or define what literature is literature can be divided into many um, uh, different uh, ways of expression you have poetry, you have uh, prose, you have, of course, in different forms, you have plays. Um, the plays means drama. Uh, you have essays and all that. So all of them comprise together to make what literature is. And uh, please excuse me. Right. Yeah. So, um, so literature can be defined in all these ways and of course despite these definitions by experts, literature can generally be called in all these ways. And uh, what is being taught in literature? What do you find in literature? In literature we, we quite often or generally anyone would say uh, literature holds life. Literature, literature holds a guideline to life life is being taught or life lives the living experience of many different people personalities an entire culture a society a group of people all of them or an individual or just a, a feeling of a particular environment all of them are being recorded and they can be called literature so all this is being taught in literature and um, uh, when it comes to literature uh, we just can't go to literature but you need a teacher of course reading a novel can be done by an individual but uh, what is expected out of a teacher when it comes to literature or what role does a teacher play in literature or the teaching of literature the teacher plays a major role in teaching of literature um, he tries to be a facilitator facilitating um, uh, meanings facilitating a particular form or a particular style to the learner or a student. Uh, I'm using the terms uh, student and the learner uh, synonymously. So this is what a, a teacher does. Right. So um, despite this uh, particular um, idea, we can all also expect that a teacher is ex, um, can 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 also uh, have information, new information. He can also infuse uh, newer information into a literature that he teaches. So all this is possible in the role of a teacher. So the role of a teacher is very significant. The role of a teacher is very notable and noteworthy. And uh, in another way, beneficial or not, uh, being an objective reader of literature, one can say that a teacher can sometimes, uh, when I say teacher, it is not just the classroom situation. Anyone who, would, who will be guiding you in, through literature, who will be gui guiding you through some uh, work of art, can also add information, can also guide you or even misguide you. All that is also possible. Thus, the role of a teacher is varied. The role of a teacher in a few places is also controversial. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, one should give um, uh, the, the, the weightage to the role of the teacher as an instructor or a facilitator. So the teacher is expected to clarify doubts. The teacher, in a very simple way, the teacher is expected to clarify doubts. The teacher is expe expected to give better explanations. The teacher is also expected to uh, um, uh, let you into a few new information. And this said, uh, 
these days teaching literature is basically learner centered so if there is no learner if there is no student around then the role of the teacher becomes uh, meaningless so the uh, role of a teacher or you call a person a teacher only when you have there is a student fraternity around you so it is usually learner centered learner centered teaching is what happens in teaching of literature so uh, this is one important aspect that all of us have to remember and uh, another thing that as we saw yesterday students should also enjoy that particular teaching otherwise this teaching and learning becomes meaningless so students should enjoy uh, the entire exercise it is actually an exercise uh, an academic exercise uh, and and the teacher should uh, please excuse me and the student should actually enjoy the learning process otherwise it becomes meaningless and as i said yesterday towards the end of the session um, the teacher should make it a very interesting activity so curiosity is an important aspect that uh, you find in uh, learners or students and that curiosity should be kindled by the teacher to make uh, the classroom a very lively one so that students pa uh, participate in it and students have something to say about uh, the class they uh, so that students do interact in the class so all this is possible and of course classroom teaching though quite often it is one sided it is supposed to be dual okay uh, it, it it should be an interaction of both sides the teacher as well as the student but there are instances when the teacher alone has to speak and the students will just have to listen usually uh, especially when it is a very descriptive session this takes place so based on all these things we can always uh, say that teaching literature is a learner centered teaching and the students should enjoy it so this said we move on to this is actually the conclusion of uh, unit 2 and then moving on to the next unit we talk about material production so when i say material production i am actually like all of us understand that material production is nothing but the uh, but the, uh, the 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 materials the handouts the support material that a person that a learner requires in the course of the reading or uh, the uh, so the support material that the teacher hands out handouts uh, during the course of uh, uh, teaching so this is actually material production so material production is a is a is a long drawn process so material production is not just a very easy one it's a long drawn process uh, it involves uh, several steps and the first step is selection and the first step is selection of um, uh, material then it uh, then it is uh, grading of material when i talk to, when i talk uh, when i say material it doesn't mean books or notebooks it's also the it's also the syllabus it's also the particular uh, subject or it's also the uh, information all the information that the information in a very comprehensive form that is going to be given to the uh, student that is going to be expressed addressed to the student so that the student grasps it and internalizes it so selection of material grading so grading deals with teachers and um, uh, teaching items so uh, so when we move to uh, selection what are the things that we select that's why i said uh, selection doesn't mean just the selection of textbooks the selection of language selection of language is one important aspect that anyone uh, need to pay attention to when teaching literature so selection of language is a very very significant aspect in a classroom environment in any teaching environment even what we do now is also a kind of classroom environment of course the methodology may be a slightly different but still it's a uh, it's a classroom environment so the language should be a language for comprehension there should be some understanding so unless the learner understands unless the learner comprehends what the teacher says what the instructor has to say then uh, the, the uh, learning doesn't simply take place so there is uh, no learning at all so that doesn't make it a classroom environment so it loses its uh, the, the basic crux of it is lost so language for comprehension is an important aspect 
um, um, in a classroom environment. So select the language for teaching. Uh, what? Uh, so the the idea is usually this is how uh, quite often people land up in bilingual method of teaching. You go to a place. You have students from rural background. They have read in L1, their native, their native tongue, their mother tongue. So L1 is uh, the the mother tongue. So they have learned in mother tongue. And when you go teach them English, so I I limit myself to English. So you go teach them just in English, or you go teach them any subject in just English and nothing else. Then there arises the difficulty of comprehension. So there is very little comprehension that takes place. Learning sometimes becomes meaningless. There is a lot of disturbance in class. All the furor over, you know, not teaching well or not understanding the subject comes quite often because of this particular language for comprehension. So choose the right language for comprehension. And uh, of course, uh, this is not possible for L2. Say you're going to teach a foreign language, you can't use the uh, native tongue for teaching a foreign language in all places. So that is very difficult. So uh, uh, when we uh, when we select language in a uh, classroom environment, the L, S, R, and W are practiced. So listening skills. So selection of language comes first. Then comes the selection. So addressing all these things, listening, address to your to the students' listening needs, address the students' spoken uh, needs. Uh, so speak so that the student comprehends. Listen so that you understand what problem the student has. Read so that the student understands. If there is a problem, explain. Write so in such a way that the student uh, understands. So comprehension is the basis of this and selection of language for comprehension is very, very significant in this particular area. And uh, uh, what kind of language do you use? How do you select the language? You select the language based on the frequency in which it is used. So you select a language if possible. All this if possible so uh, select uh, a language that is quite often used select a language that is frequently used so when you find that there is a language that is being quite often frequently used among the learners learner group and you are also familiar with that language try to use that language try to get in touch with the students so that is one important thing and uh, 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 and uh, uh, check the students type what type of students do you have are they are just out of school or are they in school are they post graduates so based on the kind of student that you have kind of learner that, uh, uh, whom you are addressing your method of teaching should certainly change of course it does change so when you go to school i think you have a totally different method of methodology for teaching and when you go to a college environment it's a uh, totally different and when you address a set of pg students it's totally different so uh, the student type is an important aspect in uh, the selection. Uh, so select selecting language as well as selecting the type of students and changing, select a particular language that is most appropriate for the student uh, group that you are addressing. So that is one thing. And uh, the comprehension level of the student. So that you may have students who have a very uh, a lower level of comprehension. Of course, usually all classes are made up of a mixture of all these things, but still, uh, you have, uh, uh, you may have uh, an entire group of students whose, um, you know, level of comprehension is a little low. So understand that their needs are different. So address them from the basics. Address them from the basics. For example, you have, you have, uh, right? Uh, you know, um, quite often we find science students uh, uh, landing in. Uh, who have had just uh, French as their second language or who have not read French at all come and land in BA French in college. So the student has absolutely no idea and now there may be slight different changes in the rules but there was a time when a student who did second language Tamil in uh, uh, her higher secondary could take a BA French in her college level. So that student has absolutely no exposure to French alphabet, even alphabet. So that student had to, has to, so understand that that student's requirement is totally different. The level of comprehension is going to be different. And based on that, begin teaching. Based on that, use the, select the language that you use. So selection of language is not using Tamil, English, French, or German. I'm talking about the kind of language you use.
the kind of the level of language that the, the teacher uses so these things like uh, these things are uh, they all have rules so there are rules uh, that uh, you have to follow when you select a particular kind of language or a level of language so when i said select a language i just did not mean a different language but i meant the level of language right so after selection of language after addressing your students in the right way comes grading so what is uh, 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 um, grading so grade your students grading your students can be done in two different ways one is dividing the students dividing the grades between students dividing uh, the students into different categories and grading them and or ordering them one after the other in a, in an order okay uh, so accordingly so ordering them one after the other is the second one but when we come to dividing students uh, based on grading dividing the grades there are uh, there there are a lot of uh, rules or there are a lot of points involved in that so you have to give importance to the simplicity aspect of grading and uh, the teachable the the teachability aspect of grading so uh, so grade them accordingly if the student has difficulty grade him accordingly if the student finds it easy to learn of course he has to be graded in a different way so uh, also uh, planning the syllabus is an important aspect of grading so only when you know who your students are you can plan a particular syllabus for the students and uh, uh, that student can be graded accordingly so this is one important um, aspect so planning the syllabus is also significant in this particular uh, 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 level and uh, framing of syllabus plan a syllabus and then frame the syllabus accordingly so that the students uh, uh, you know get something out of that particular syllabus that you have framed so all this is actually as we said earlier it is learner oriented so based on the learner uh, keeping the interest of the learner in mind all these things have to be set right before beginning to teach and uh, the third method of uh, uh, material production is uh, uh, audio visual method so using audio visual method first is the selection of language then you have grading what grades to give how to grade then you have audio visual methods to enhance your teaching um, uh, enhance the level of understanding for the students so you can use motion pictures uh, and uh, actually audio visual method refers to listening and speaking not reading and writing when i say audio visual method it refers to listening and speaking skills so uh, you can use motion pictures you can use slides film strips you can use use visual stimuli to help students understand the particular subject better so uh, pictures can be used or even in a classroom environment pictures that you have in a classroom blackboard flash cards charts and tables at a school level i think all of us are familiar with all of them at a school level so all of them are very become very significant and uh, these methods help us uh, in better uh, understanding understanding the syllabus uh, understanding the subject better it helps the learners that's it. so uh, these are the things that uh, we have to um, uh, keep in mind when we pro uh, when we uh, produce material for uh, a classroom environment so um, once everything is all the material is produced once the level of the teach, students is uh, uh, group of students is uh, evaluated and the methodology is also decided upon along with the audio visual uh, methods uh, the evaluation takes place so what is evaluation evaluation is nothing but determining the value so determining the value of the student determining the level of the student determining the level of comprehension of the student based on that you grade the student that this is called evaluation so evaluation is the most uh, you know you can see most important part for the teacher so the teacher's uh, job just doesn't end with teaching producing material planning things and uh, planning the syllabi and uh, you know executing it uh, so evaluation is an important aspect that the teacher has to pay attention to so uh, to determine the value of the student so um, uh, so in fact we can say education has um, three steps so when it comes to evaluation 
uh, that too in in the in the case of education there are three steps the needs are assessed when you evaluate the needs are assessed what you require is assessed first learning objectives are spelled out and uh, the program is designed first find out what the student needs first find out what the learner needs or a group of learners need and then uh, um, the learning objectives the aim of the uh, learner uh, is being spelled out and a program is designed based on the requirement of the learner and then the evaluation of results takes place so all these things are very important uh, these are all the step by step process that uh, usually happen when you assess um, or when you evaluate a uh, the set of learners or a particular individual learner this is a this is education in three steps right all of them all of these three things what does the uh, learner need uh, 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 let me design a program for the learner and let me evaluate the learner as a final step all of them are interrelated all of them are interrelated and uh, they this is actually depicted in the form of a triangle the triangle of evaluation these three are depicted in the form of a triangle and that triangle is called the triangle of evaluation this idea this concept was set forth by benjamin s bloom okay so benjamin s bloom is an expert who set forth this idea of the triangle of evaluation which is a bit, which actually has the three steps that i just now mentioned uh, as a um, as a, a, an equally important part of that particular triangle so evaluation is nothing but appraisal so when you appraise a person uh, you evaluate the person right what is the aim of evaluation so um, the aim of evaluating why do you need to evaluate a student so uh, um, you need to evaluate a student because you need to inform the student you need to inform about inform the student his level and report to the parents the level of the student the progress that the student does and uh, eval uh, 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 evaluate methods of teaching so once you evaluate you also find out if you need to reevaluate the methods of teaching is there any other better method that if the student has not done well is there any other better method i can make the student learn so that is possible so uh, all these are steps in evaluation why do you the aim of evaluation these are the aims of evaluation why do you need to evaluate motivate the student so in order to motivate the student He, the student has to be evaluated only then you will know why do you need to motivate the student uh, and diagnose the strength and weakness of the student so the student's strength and weakness should be diagnosed so that you can help the student you can aid the student in developing himself so the student's progress uh, rests on the teacher's evaluation methodology so this is the aim of evaluation and and one thing we have to remember is evaluation is a continuous process so evaluation doesn't take place just on the day of the examination or uh, right after the examination evaluation is a continuous process it is a comprehensive process so all the faculty that the uh, student has employed all these days his uh, uh, listening skill his uh, speak is spoken skill his uh, of course may, may not be spoken of course there are places his uh, spoken skill his um, writing and reading all of them are together evaluated that's why it's called comprehensive of course while the student writes a physical examination his speaking spoken skills may not be evaluated but these days you have uh, free talks in schools you have uh, uh, presentations made by students all of them are evaluated in order to come to a conclusion about how the student has performed in a particular class so that is why we can say evaluation is a continuous process from the day the student is um, uh, uh, enrolled in a course and to the day the student gets his uh, you know finishes his exam the evaluation process goes on it is a continuous process it is comprehensive because it addresses the l s r w all of them that is one thing we have to remember right the tools for evaluation what are the tools for evaluation of course all of us know what the tools for evaluation are a small list of them have been given tests you have tests you have questionnaire you have observation observation you know written observation you can have any observation observation in a laboratory you can you have checklists you have uh, rating scales what rating do you give for the student and his performance 
you have an anecdotal record for the student's performance, critical incidents, critical incidents, how does the student behave with others, how does the student mingle with others, how is his social outlook, how is his behavior in class, conduct, that's what I mean, interview. So, tools for evaluation, interview, talk to the student and find out, another teacher can talk and find out, you have small viva, was, viva sessions in, uh, in, in schools and colleges to find out, they are like a kind of interview. Uh, you, maybe you can sit and question the student or you can make another teacher sit and inquire the student about what is happening in class, how he has performed in class. So all these are tools for evaluation that are, that are being practiced always. Right. Of course, test is one important aspect. What is a test? So you need a test to evaluate. Only a test can tell you if a student is good, uh, you know, uh, better or worse. Because a student is not a single person in a class. A student is usually studied by the teacher, he is assessed by the teacher uh, in comparison to other students in class. So a test is very important in order to assess where he stands in the class, in which, uh, in which rung of the ladder the student stands in the class, at which level he is in the class. So a good test is uh, very important in a classroom environment and, uh, and its function is to value the student in, uh, in, in, um, in relation to or, uh, or in relevance to other students in class, other learners in the class. So that will help in a competitive environment, that will help in assessing his strengths and weaknesses and that will also help the student to realize uh, what, are the, what are the areas where he has to progress. It will also help the teacher to motivate the student. That motivation is an important aspect, it's also a continuous aspect. So uh, what should be tested? Uh, so when you, when you evaluate a student, what should be tested? I have already told the, the answer. The LSRW abilities of the student should be tested. So what should be tested? The, the LSRW uh, of the student should be tested. Of course, as I said, each of them can be tested in a different way. So when the student uh, writes his exam, it is the written. Uh, when the student does uh, reading exercises in class, it is the reading. And spoken assessment can be done while the student gives pres delivers presentations, delivers a talk. Um, and the listening uh, comprehension, when he listens to class, it usually ex explains in his class behavior. So uh, there are many types of uh, tests uh, available. When we come to tests, tests are an important part of evaluation. Uh, the first kind of test is achievement test. So achievement test can be uh, you know, divided into two kinds of, uh, further two kinds of tests. Class progressive test. What is a class progressive test? Class progressive test is a classroom test. Simply put, it's a classroom test. Uh, it is a situation or a problem test. So a, a situation or a problem is, press, is provided to the student, uh, uh, you know, instantaneously, and he has to give an answer, write an essay, answer this question. It can even be oral, listening and spoken. It can involve both of those things. Class progressive tests. It's usually classroom test, not necessarily a written test. Right? Pictorial items. Uh, give a, give a, give several pictures uh, over a, in a chart. Make the student remember them. Try try to see if the student can recall it, or ask the student what he can talk about uh, the test. Look at the picture and then talk. As I said, it involves listening and speaking. Then you have items for cognitive uh, uh, aims. Cognitive understanding. An item is put on the table. An item is put in a, on a chart. An item is put on the uh, digi board. The student is asked to talk about it. Okay, immediately giving a crash test. So uh, evaluating this uh, student uh, on on the spot in the classroom. And uh, items for written test. You can also give written test. Write an essay. Sudden uh, a sudden test. Uh, uh, sometimes most often students are not happy with these tests. We don't want tests, we want, uh, uh, we want information, we want uh, ad, uh, an advance notice. So uh, th these are the kinds of uh, class uh, uh, progressive tests that take place within a um, class. And uh, the other type, this is one form of achievement test. You can evaluate the achievement of the student. Another form of achievement test is standardized tests. What are standardized tests? Standardized tests are tested and tried methods. A questionnaire. That same questionnaire could have been given to the previous set of students also. 
tested and tried methods of evaluating the student. Class progressive tests mean uh, instantaneous tests, immediate tests. Okay, right under the uh, uh, class you give a test. But uh, standardized tests mean tested and tried methods of evaluating in the students, giving them a questionnaire, asking them to make, an, uh, make a, um, a statistical evaluation, all those things. And uh, they have rules and regulations. These tests, standardized tests, have rules and regulations, unlike class progressive tests. In a classroom environment, the teacher can ask to just write. Uh, you can write for one page. If possible, you can write two pages. Anything. No rules, regulations are usually employed in that kind of evaluation. But in standardized tests, there are evaluation methodologies. There are rules and regulations <coughs> for measuring the individual preference. Okay. So uh, when you have uh, such tests, each student can be evaluated separately. And usually, either or questions or yes or no questions are given in this type of standardized tests. You have to remember that this is not the case in the other test in a classroom environment. What is the merit? What are the merits of standardized tests? You quick valuation, all right? So you have quick valuation methods for such standardized tests for answering such because it is either or uh, uh, yes or no type. So you can immediately assess uh, quickly assess the student. And the other kind of test is uh, the uh, and the limits limitations of this particular standardized test is. There is no room for explanation. A student is given only the option of yes or no. So even if the student is very good at explaining something, then there is no room for explanation and he will not be able to express his ability to do an explanation. So this, these are the pros and cons of standardized the, uh, tests. The second kind of test is proficiency test. So when I say proficiency, it means the expertise of a student, not on the whole, but in a particular area. Proficiency in language and linguistics. Not all students get. All students study uh, uh, English literature, BA English or MA English. But one particular student's ma student must have scored better in language and linguistics paper. So uh, proficiency for achieving very high marks in language and linguistics paper. So this particular proficiency uh, evaluation is individual oriented. It is not on the whole, it is not for his gender proficiency, but for his uh, proficiency in a particular uh, subject. Uh, specific skills are being evaluated and not general achievement is involved. Then you have aptitude test. Aptitude is totally different from proficiency. Aptitude refers to not the, uh, uh, not the your ability to memorize things or anything, but the intelligence, the intelligence quotient of the student the age of the student aptitude aptitude test motivation of the student the memory phonological sensibility of the student all these things are being evaluated when all these things are being evaluated those uh, evaluatory methods uh, are called aptitude test aptitude test is very different from proficiency test then you have diagnostic test diagnostic test is very important because it has room for remedial action in uh, diagnostic tests, uh, the problem of a student is identified. Usually diagnosis tests are given when there is a problem. Such students are made to write a particular set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, question papers. Um, uh, and uh, they are diagnosed for their special uh, problems. Maybe, uh, you know, that particular student is very good at, uh, is very good in uh, reading, speaking, uh, and listening, but he is not uh, not at all good in his spoken uh, methodologies, in his spoken um, um, evaluate, eva evaluations. So the problem is identified, uh, it is also diagnosed, and a remedial action is planned. So diagnostic test, as the name goes, helps a person find out what is the problem exactly, and then also plans for remedies. So this is uh, all about uh, uh, diagnostic uh, tests. So diagnostic test um, for a student is very, very important because uh, because uh, not all students are uh, are going to get uh, the, the highest of marks. So there might be students who are underperformance. So underperformance, underperformance cannot be left or abandoned uh, just like that in a classroom environment. So their problems will also have to be addressed. So the diagnostic test will address the problems faced by the underperformance and underperformance. 
and uh, uh, a remedial action is planned and evaluatory methods for that those particular students as special cases will also be planned and they will be executed thus making the students um, uh, you know come up to the levels of the all the other achievers better achievers so um uh, so 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 uh, uh, types of uh, tests or types of methods employed or what are the writing uh, uh, possibilities written forms of evaluation you can have a give a dictation you can give translation works for students paraphrasing ask the student to paraphrase and ask the student to do a pressy writing all these things are possible summarizing summarizing is the best quite often summarizing has rules and regulations of course all the other ones may not have exactly rules and regulations but summary writing often has rules and regulations and the student will have to uh, you know um, meet the standards in order to be set uh, you know in order to be better qualified so all these things uh, uh, form a part of evaluation uh, process and evaluation process is very very important and it is actually of course the students are the ones who do that but evaluation is teacher oriented maybe we can say evaluation is teacher oriented now um, uh, the, the, this is exactly teaching english how to do how to use language what are the uh, methodologies used what are the step by step process used all these things have been dealt with now uh, these are the ideal class situations we have been dealing with ideal class situations but what happens when you deal with classroom problems so this uh, forms the concluding part of it so when you deal with uh, classroom problems you you they, you have so many challenges that you have to uh, uh, take up so what are those challenges so dealing with the classroom problems uh, 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 leads us to a, a study of uh, the beginnings of a classroom how did classrooms begin so classrooms began in the beginnings uh, classrooms uh, were actually personalized education there was a guru and there was a student so uh, i think all of us understand there were ashrams you had a guru the student went to the guru's place and he had to stay with the guru and do everything get his education uh, completed and come back a successful person a, 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 an enlightened person i maybe you can put it like that so education was personalized in the beginnings personalized this student went to that guru the guru paid entire all his attention to that particular student maybe there were many students but still it was personalized education with industrialization the next step was industrialization with industrialization mass education became the norm so once industrialization uh, uh, you know became prevalent mass education became the norm institutions were set up academic institutions were set up and students had to go to a classroom environment classroom with students gradually evolved after industrialization so before industrialization it was personalized education with under a guru so this is how classrooms came into uh, in a very brief way this is how classrooms came into existence right so today uh, the system is for a formal environment you have a uh, an institution it's an educational institution you have classrooms you have a huge uh, infrastructure it is highly organized it's a formal environment so some have uniforms some don't have uh, some have you know uh, vehicles to carry the students students will have to stay there you know uh, learn and come back home so all of them have become formal and highly organized it's uh, uh, and this formal environment this organized environment is a physical and psychological ground for teaching and learning so this environment just uh, uh, is nothing else but a physical and psychological environment for learning so once the student comes into that particular setup he psychologically understand he psychologically bent to do certain things only and that come under the purview of the particular institution and the administration so it's for the teacher to it's a physical environment uh, and education takes place teaching learning takes place but uh, the psychological fact is uh, the the psychological environment that comes along with that is 
the psychological environment that comes along with that tells that it is a restricted environment. But we should always remember that it is a multi-dimensional environment. So it is in that place that um, that students progress. Uh, teachers also uh, hone their uh, teaching skills. Uh, students learn. Students are being evaluated. Students come up with uh, degrees, and it is from there that the students uh, uh, graduate. So it's multi-dimensional. That particular place is not going to just develop the student, enlighten the student by way of bookish knowledge, but it's also it's also going to uh, uh, develop the student in a psychological way, uh, in a social way, in a cultural way. So all possible ways of uh, development is uh, have takes place in that particular organized environment called a um, you know educational institution. One thing we have to remember is in a class in a class uh, in classroom environment, um, a classroom environment is multidimensional and it is simultaneous. So simultaneity is an important aspect of multi uh, of of the uh, classroom environment because in a classroom environment all teach all students are treated in a, in the same way. All students are being taught simultaneously. So when I said simultaneous at the same time, I meant at the same time. So all of them are being given inputs at the same time and all of them graduate, uh, you know, write exams. They are being evaluated and they graduate at the same time. So it is a simultaneous process for a, for a group of large group of students and it is immediate. You study well, you are immediately rewarded. Uh, you the, uh, in the psychological or in the uh, social individual level, there is a problem. You are being immediately reprimanded. So what you do has an immediate effect in a classroom environment. So uh, thus, classroom environment is actually very rewarding with the advent of formal educational methods. So and there is also a history. Uh, when I say history, I mean this class is best. This teacher is best. History goes goes on this student studied in this college he is a, a, a he is an alumni of this particular institution so there is history there is history or there are uh, there is a past to each and every classroom there is a past to each and every success story and uh, so forth so uh, classroom environment is a totally different environment and of course there are certain challenges or certain or many challenges that a classroom environment can um, you know bring up so uh, in, in today's case, uh, the communication situation is the most important. So classroom environment involves communication. So uh, classroom environment exactly involves a lot of communication from the teacher. And of course, the learner will also have to communicate. And what are the challenges that are being faced? Of course, uh, one, uh, when we talk about the problems of students, so do teachers have a lot of problems. So cat calls, paper darts in a classroom. There is a new teacher or even uh, experienced teachers have a set of naughty students. You uh, you know, they, they, they throw uh, paper darts at the teacher uh, on the first day. They have cat calls, whistling, all these things take place. But uh, it these things, these challenges that the teacher faces in a classroom situation um, uh, by the students is actually a test of not the teacher's ability, not the teacher's expertise, not the teacher's knowledge, but it, but it is a test for the teacher's um, patience and dedication to the profession. So uh, no teacher uh, has been spared. No teacher must have you know, crossed uh, without experiencing all these things from the students. So all these things are possible in, in, a, in an educational uh, institution. And uh, uh, I don't think there are many cases where teachers have left their jobs, abandoned their jobs because of uh, uh, the, the nicknames that the students have given them or because of the, uh, you know, uh, throwing papers and all that. So that uh, is uh, usually unheard of. Right. Do they give up? That is the question in, uh, question we have to, uh, uh, you know, answer now. Have the teachers given up the profession because of all these things? The answer is a big no. Not many teachers have given up the profession because the students have given them nicknames and the students have thrown paper darts at uh, paper planes at them. So that is uh, simply unknown. And uh, um, uh, as I said, teaching 
works on communication. So uh, let us now concentrate on the teachers. So teachers usually don't give up their jobs because they are being, you know, made fun of by the uh, students. It does happen. It is, it is a very, it is a great challenge that teachers have to undergo. But apart from that, there are other challenges that a, a teacher uh, has to face. So the problems that a teacher faces uh, are uh, usually comes with uh, communication. And what, what is the basis of all that? Lack of confidence. Teachers who have lack of confidence have, have a problem in the classroom. Teachers with lack of training also have problems. Of course, today we have many methods uh, of uh, training a teacher. Training a teacher has lots of uh, methodology methods. Now, organized methods, you have uh, teacher training colleges and all that. But despite all that, some teachers might lack confidence. Some teachers might lack training that they find it very difficult to teach a group of students. Some uh, some teachers may have this particular uh, you know curious problem of subject knowledge. So they may be very good at talking and all that, but they may be able to face the students, but they will not have the subject knowledge required of them, and so they fail in teaching. And most importantly, some teachers do not have communication skills. Communication skills is very very important. So communication skills is very important, uh, and. Uh, please excuse me when 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 some teachers lack in communication skills they you know they become a, a failures uh, that has to be uh, you know uh, looked into and uh, some teachers rarely lack their interest or the ability to teach uh, they 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 lack the aptitude to teach so this is a very rare case uh, because not all uh, teachers uh, most teachers come with interest and uh, the motivation part is also very important. Some teachers are less motivated to teach, especially when you have a difficult set of students. They have difficulty. They have problem with the motivation. They are being, uh, uh, they, they are quite often being discouraged from teaching the students. So that's when the, uh, the students come up with, uh, sorry, the teacher comes up with the problem for a lack of motivation and uh, they look back. That is a problem. Now, what are the problems faced by the students? Uh, well, I think all teachers can make a huge list of all that. But what are the specific problems faced by the students? Lack of attention. Some students lack attention. Some students have poor IQ, while others have high IQ. That is also a problem. <clears throat> a student who has poor IQ will not listen. He may find it very difficult. He may be a dull student. A, a student with high IQ may be hyperactive. He will only be disturbing the class. He will have very less time to listen to the class. And uh, unmotivated students can also cause a lot of problems. And uh, students with lack of interests, another problem. So students from a very difficult social environment um, will, can, can cause very complex problems. You will first have to understand the student and his background before you, you know, give him some kind of solution. So that is a complex situation. Quite often student, with young students, uh, uh, teachers do face that. And uh, the expectation of the students, Somehow, sometimes uh, students with very high, high IQ have great expectations. And another important problem is uh, students come with the expectation, they believe that they will understand what the teacher says, or they believe that the teacher will you know, uh, um, teach them in such a way that they understand everything. Sometimes language becomes a big problem and the students find it very difficult. Their expectations are not met and so they don't um, perform well. So organizational problem. If the student has a problem in the organization, then that uh, the teacher will uh, still face problems. Noise is another problem that can put off students. A very disturbed uh, class with a disturbing environment, a lot of disturbances can cause problems for students. Seating problem. Too many students. These days, that is a problem. There was a time when there were just 40 students or so. But now you have 60 students and on. There are classes with 150 students. There are private institutions with so many students that it's a huge ocean uh, of uh, students uh, sitting in front of you. So uh, uh, to uh, the students also find it very disturbing to listen because the teacher sometimes may not be audible. The it is impossible for a teacher to scream or holler. Right? Lack of ventilation of also causes uh, problems at, at times. So um, uh, based on all these things, we can uh, say that uh, problems uh, for students is also um, uh, many in number and they have to be addressed 
uh, for the teaching or the communication to take place in a very proper way. So um, actually, uh, if a classroom is a, if there is a lot, if a classroom is a failure, actually, in reality, you can attest it to that, you can relate it to the teacher's performance. Part of the problem is the teacher. The teacher, more than teaching quite often these days, managing the class, the teacher has to be a better manager than a teacher. First, try to control the students. If the students cannot be controlled, it is very difficult to begin teaching. So the part of the problem can be solved by the teacher. That's why I said part of the problem is the teacher. So if the teacher knows how to control the students, if, if the teacher knows how to manage the students, then it is it is very easy to begin uh, uh, you know um, you know gra grabbing the attention of the students so uh, when it comes to students students can be divided into uh, hyperactive students active students dull students and disturbing students so who is the hyperactive student a student with a very high iq can be a hyperactive student a student with a, a student who is a very active is usually the best student you have no problem he listens well he performs well and he also when you evaluate he is one among the best who is a dull student someone with a very low iq is uh, the dull student and uh, who is a student who disturbs a student with uh, uh, an extremely questionable social environment a student with a lot of uh, expectations high expectations and of course sometimes uh, unmotivated students can also cause uh, disturbances uh, when it comes to uh, a, a classroom environment so all these kind of students have to be evaluated and they have to be served the right plate so that they uh, uh, by that i mean they have to be managed well by the teacher the teacher will first have to be a manager who controls the students who organizes the students in the right way so a successful teacher is a good manager and uh, uh, the physical environment should be taken care of that can be taken care of by the organization the teacher should be very efficient so the teacher's efficiency is what determines uh, an efficient classroom environment so the um, the teacher's efficiency is most important especially with the challenges in the 21st century the teacher's efficiency it has quite often become a, a questioning a question mark in several situations so the teacher's status as a manager first and then as a by manager i mean a person who controls the uh, the different kinds of students the teacher first as a manager and then as the teacher can uh, you know create success stories so uh, when we talk about large classrooms this problem quite often comes in large classrooms and large classrooms are the norm these days as i said 150 students in a single class uh, you know is uh, is the is a sorry tale uh, these days but that is the reality in today's situation so large classrooms and cooperative learning strategies are very very important large classrooms and cooperative reading st learning strategies are very important cooperative learning strategies are usually task based so once you give tasks to these students it is very efficiently managed class it becomes a very efficiently managed class so uh, so what what happens in large classes what are you supposed to do in large classes to enhance cooperative learning uh, what are the strategies it is basically task based you uh, it involves planning a lot of planning it involves a lot of organizing coordinating and directing it also involves the most important aspect controlling and then communicating so you need to plan to uh, uh, manage a large class you have to make it organized by giving them the right task at the right time and especially the right group coordinate them so uh, all the trouble troublemakers put in put together can be you know extremely exhausting for the student uh, for the teacher so organize them in such a way that that a particular subject matter and a uh, and a particular group of students are being dealt with coordinate them so uh, all your attention the constant attention can help in coordinating direct them in the right way so unless they, they so um, you know putting them in teams does not solve the problem 
putting them in teams and coordinating directing them constantly is very important and controlling them constantly is also an important aspect in large classrooms and cooperative learning uh, environment uh, so communicating is another thing so commun so do after doing everything if you are not able to if you do not communicate to them it is uh, uh, totally uh, it is a loss so communicate to them what you uh, uh, want them to do so only then it can be a success right so all these things uh, can help what are the different uh, uh, these are the basic things that a teacher does so what else can be done in large classrooms learning together that's what takes place in large classrooms a lot when you learn together heterogeneous uh, grouping of students is possible so heterogeneous grouping of people uh, students so some student uh, the, the dull student as well as the active student can be put together in groups make them read so they may uh, you know help each other and uh, and uh, uh, interdependability is an important aspect that takes place so the the duller student will, would like to talk to the better student and seek help from him so they might work as a team and then you know help each other uh, or at least the dull student will get the right help that he needs so learning together is an important aspect in large classrooms environment teams games and tournaments the set up teams set up games for them and uh, uh, set up uh, <clears throat> uh, tournaments for them by tournaments i don't exactly mean physical activity it can be a teamwork uh, you know making them into teams making them play games uh, you know um, uh, very uh, thought provoking games or uh, subject oriented games tournaments uh, of course physical activity can also be uh, included in this to make them physically active so that you know they become active uh, you know mentally too so all this is possible in large classrooms group investigation uh, i think in one of my previ previous classes i spoke about group discussion so group discussion is an important aspect uh, group discussion enhances a uh, thought process so group investigation is together find out the solution to a particular thing so that is called group investigation so uh, involve all the students encourage them to do all that so th so that becomes group investigation and uh, constructive controversy uh, is another aspect is another uh, methodology that is being employed in large classroom environments constructive con controversy means uh, you know bringing together two students asking them to challenge each other you know creating a team dividing the team into two or three or four and giving each of them a point of view a totally controversial point of view so that they argue there is a discussion or rather an argument that continues and with the help of the argument these students might be able to come up with newer ideas sometimes they are uh, roles are reversed team a becomes team b the idea of team a goes to team b and the idea of team b goes to team a so they have to talk uh, in support of uh, whatever idea comes to them this is called a constructive controversy so this is another method method used in large classrooms and cooperative this is one of the one of the cooperative learning strategy right J uh, jigsaw procedure so jigsaw procedure once again you have uh, controversial ideas being put forth and you and there is an argument St student teams um, uh, are very important student teams of course i think we've been speaking about student teams uh, so what can you do quiz can be given individual quiz test all of them can be um, uh, used as tools in this particular uh, cooperative learning strategies it usually uh, basically if you uh, if you understand if you if you have listened to what i've been telling it is a team activity it is a team based activity especially in large classrooms where you, uh, teacher might sometimes find the huge number very uh, very overwhelming uh, not frightening overwhelming the the teacher may resort to such group activity so that uh, he is able to control first the class and then also give them meaningful activities in order to enhance their understanding capacity and then organize them so once organized students quite often you know they they comply by the rules and regulations they become a easy group a easy group for the teacher to manage that's it so uh, another is curriculum packages i think uh, these days you have curriculum packages the six months package uh, for uh, NEET and JE training, you have six months package, one year package. So that is also uh, uh, that is also yeah cooperative learning strategy. So together, put together, the student is not going to uh, run, opt out of that 
because he is now in a uh, curriculum package. So uh, he has paid, uh, this is just an example, one example, uh, he has paid a huge amount of money. He is inside this curriculum package, uh, package deal. So uh, stay with us, pay this money, stay with us. We will help you with question papers. We will help you with uh, tutors. We will help you with all supporting material for studying, completing your higher secondary plus one and plus two. So this is curriculum package. This is also one uh, very effective cooperative learning strategy. So we have dealt. So that's also a team activity because not one student is going to uh, you know take this package. Uh, there will be many students, and one teacher will be addressing all of them. So there are many advantages to this because it 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 enhances such team activities uh, have a lot of advantages. Students uh, have an uh, enhanced feeling of uh, you know um, assurance. They are assured of success. They feel so confident uh, by interdependability. One student uh, you know trying to clarify with the other student rather than the teacher uh, about whom they may be very you know um, they may have hesitations they find it easier to ask questions get answers from their teammates and uh, especially when there is a uh, when i when i spoke about constructive controversy a uh, group of students divided into uh, small small teams two different ideas opposite ideas given and then they uh, go undergo a discussion or an argument there is a healthy relationship healthy environment being set up in a classroom situation so it uh, it, miti it mitigates it, it reduces um, any other kind of controversy any other kind of enmity but helps also in the you know enhancement of learning and comprehension so the role of the teacher is very very important in all these things uh, the role of the teacher can uh, never be um, uh, can can never be uh, thought of as secondary in all these situations uh, though that uh, you, you know as i said uh, earlier uh, you need learners you need students so that the role of a teacher is meaningful uh, similarly the role of a teacher is very important very meaningful and it is a responsibility uh, that has to be taken seriously because the responsibility of a teacher can be understand understood as their role in the society so the responsibility of the teacher doesn't stop with uh, that particular learning environment the teaching environment so the responsibility is also carried over to the society by the students that he produces by student i mean i don't mean very young students even learners any kind of learner can take that uh, teacher's responsibility uh, out of the classroom environment and into the society so the teacher should try to develop individuals as well as teach them to learn content uh, i think all of us will agree teachers don't just teach and you know come off they sometimes set examples in a very uh, you know uh, in a very very uh, subtle way they can be examples to uh, students they can develop individuals in a in a very um, you know subtle way um, the teacher remains a curious learner all his life so since the teacher himself is a uh, learner and he himself is a kind of student he can empathize with the student who is sitting in right in front of him so to attain mastery he has to have the subject uh, uh, he has to ha have thoroughly mastered the subject uh, so a, a teacher is always a learner he is never not a learner so you can always uh, you know you can um, uh, leave the student in the care of the teacher he will certainly have to be responsible and he should use a variety of instructional aids <coughs> so this uh, is a, they, these are all very important uh, uh, playing the role of a teacher is not that easy so the teacher will have to use a variety of instructional aids so as to motivate the students first uh, uh, and kindle their curiosity and also uh, make them finally comprehend what he is trying to say so that is the role of the teacher with the help of instructional aids he can do that and the teacher is also responsible for using imagination and resourcefulness in presenting a learning situation so uh, no teacher can explain upper any certain things without an example some things have to need and need to be explained with the help of an example so those examples are very important for the uh, learner as well as for the teacher so those examples will always sometimes examples stay for a longer time with the student than the exact uh, uh, idea uh, the teacher should cultivate his own individuality he, he must love to teach and love the subject uh, the style of teaching is also very important each teacher has his or her own way of uh, teaching there is a style to a teacher i think any student uh, who is in a classroom environment can imitate a, a teacher uh, very beautifully 
only because the teacher every teacher has an individual style if the teachers are like robots uh, then it is very difficult to uh, differentiate between one teacher and the other and then that makes a whole uh, idea of teaching learning very boring so every teacher is a special individual and uh, uh, he has his own individuality that is not lost never lost the teacher should also adopt a holistic approach in education uh, he, he should combine the values uh, with the he should combine all values uh, and the recent methods uh, recent techniques for teaching all the methodologies as we spoke about audio visual uh, things all the tools for teaching uh, any subject so the recent tools should be used for teaching any subject and once the teacher recognizes the above said roles his and responsibilities he can uh, be a very successful uh, teacher so this the this is the role of the teacher <coughs> but at the same time uh, the teacher has to uh, pay attention to the um, political aspect of teaching when i say political aspect i am not talking about uh, anything else the teacher will have to there are many recommendations having uh, many recommendations have been made for the teachers to be responsible uh, teachers so what are the uh, responsibilities of a teacher um, of course we all understand what the uh, responsibility of a teacher is using politically correct language is another important aspect that a teacher has to keep in mind that is uh, uh, the teacher when the student has certain rules and regulations the teacher also has rules and regulations or ethics are important ethically the teacher has to steer clear of certain things that are a big no no in a classroom environment the teacher will have to avoid sexist language uh, the that is the, the teacher will have to use politically correct language when i say politically correct language the teacher cannot just uh, you know go and uh, talk about uh, anything um, and everything in a classroom so there are certain rules and regulations for the teacher so what the teacher speaks in a class is very important so there are certain things that are taboo for a teacher to use in uh, uh, to talk in class um, uh, for example please bear with me language is a very sensitive issue and the teacher should know what to talk and what not to talk so uh, these days sexist language being used in class is very very um, you know is a is a big no and uh, when the when the, the teacher is supposed to use the common word for example there are a list of common words that a teacher can use so uh, chair, chair chairman cannot be used because it is sexist uh, it degrades the woman so chairperson is the right word for the teacher to use these days actor cannot actor or actress such things like the masculine and the feminine shouldn't be used actor is fine so these are things that a teacher um, uh, has to do uh, when he is in class he has to and at the same time uh, in certain places the teacher has to be very particular about what he uh, uh, talks for example uh, english language has a lot of things that uh, have come in english language has been very receptive but the teacher will have to uh, limit himself to what he speaks uh, maybe i'll give you uh, one or two example he she is fine but at the same time the teacher cannot uh, use uh, waitress lady professor male nurse cannot be used so uh, male nurse lady professor waitress all of them are very sexist language so the te the teacher is supposed to use server professor and nurse so gender neutral words have to be used by the teacher so at the same time if there are many scholars in the class of course uh, this doesn't apply exactly to our classroom environment the teacher will have to uh, use all the scholars by the surname um, uh, only so this is one important thing this can avoid uh, gender stereotyping uh, and uh, this has to be followed in uh, most places uh, consistently putting reference to males before references to females also has to be avoided so uh, this kind of uh, language uh, being uh, carefully using language in a classroom situation uh, not talking about any particular um, you know all the differences um, uh, and all the things that have attached stigmas to them should not be used in class these are the things that the teacher has to be very wary about 
so in short the teacher's responsibility to the society and the teacher's responsibility to teaching itself is a very important one and the teacher has to take it very seriously right so uh, with this i think we come to the um, uh, end of our uh, course all the units have been completed uh, of course you can take a look at the study material that has been given to you and uh, uh, please excuse me one second so uh, so this is all about uh, teaching of english language in classroom situation right so we have completed all the titles all the title all the small titles have been dealt with uh, carefully so maybe you can take a look at uh, your study material and uh, take help from that so thank you so much for having been here